Howdy folks. So I know it's been a while, but uh, with my health and work and all sorts of other things, at the end of the day I don't have the energy to do much of anything, let alone make videos, but I will uh, try and make a couple uh, about this. So this is an old IBM electric typewriter, and I picked this up at an antique store for about 25 bucks. And uh, before anyone comments about how this isn't worth that much and all that stuff, and I'm really, I got this because I'm, I'm interested and I want to have fun with it. It's not something that I am going to be owning for, um, you know, as an investment. I don't really care if it, you know, appreciates in value or anything like that. It's just, it's just fun. Um, and anyway, so I picked this up. It was sold as non-working condition. And I got it home and I wanted to sort of figure out what this was. Now, of course, IBM is really famous for the Selectric, um, electric typewriters. Now, this is not a Selectric typewriter. Um, as you can see, it has hammers in it. Um, so this is either in model A, B, or C, and uh, it's a Canadian-made uh, unit, and so it doesn't have a model number on it. It has all the nameplates, but they don't actually have a model. So I ended up using the serial number to look this up. Of course, being an IBM product, I could do that. And so this is a model A manufactured in 1953 which is the last year they made the Model A before they switched to the Model B. Uh, the A, B, and C, they all look the same on the outside. They've just got different internals. And uh, so my goal with this thing is to uh, basically resurrect it and get it working again. I'm not going to be restoring it, um, so it's not going to look pretty on the outside, but it will work, and that's really what I want. I want to be able to actually type out a document on this and have all the features work. That's my goal at the end of the day. And um, I'm, I've chosen to document this not only because I feel bad for not putting out a lot of videos, but also um, there really doesn't appear to be too much information online about these, uh, these older IBM electric typewriters, uh, especially when it comes to repair and service. And so because my unit has uh, problems, I want to document what, I've, uh, what, I've, what I'm doing to, uh, to fix them and hopefully anybody else who comes across one with the same problems can just reference my uh, my sort of video documentation. And uh, I've done about a day's worth of work on this already that I didn't film unfortunately. So I'm going to give a recap of what has happened so far um, just to get you uh, up to speed and then I will uh, do things, I'll film them as they happen. And uh, Anything else I need to mention before I get started, I guess? I don't really think so. So, anyway, yeah, this was sold as non-working. Now, first of all, I'll mention this is an electric typewriter. Um, this is not an electronic typewriter, and as a result, this doesn't have any electronic components in it. It's fully mechanical. Um, basically, there is just a, a power cord which goes directly into an electric motor, and that's it. There's just a motor, and it just always spins when the unit's on and everything else is mechanical. And I'm not gonna say that I'm super mechanically inclined. Uh, you know, I know some things, but I'm, I'm far more into electronics, so this is a, a kind of a different thing for me to be working on. Now, uh, of course, this being not working, my hope was that it was something simple um, that I could fix um, or get a part for being an IBM product. They probably made you know, tens of thousands of these things. Uh, hundreds of thousands of these things that getting apart would probably be not not too difficult. So I got the unit home. Uh, this thing weighs probably 50 or 60 pounds. It's all metal. Uh, it's currently, all these covers are actually, I've taken them off and I just put them back on to start this video, but they're all a little bit loose now. But this thing is very heavy. Uh, I got this thing home and uh, before I plugged it in, of course, I'm not plugging in a 65-year-old piece of equipment without some sort of pre-flight electrical check and uh, within about 60 seconds of using the multimeter, uh, I came to the conclusion that the power switch was open circuit. Um, there was power going through the cord, getting to the motor, but the power switch, no matter what position it was in, was open. And uh, that was actually a really great sign because the power switch being open um, is probably one of the best things that could have happened to this because um, you know, what started going through my head was, oh, well, maybe one day the power switch broke, it didn't turn on anymore, and then somebody just parked it in their garage or their attic or something and then eventually I got it and so in that case the rest of the unit would have been fully working and I can just fix something like that and from what I've seen over the last you know eight or so hours on this project um, I think that is mostly true um, because 
all of the problems that I've came across, you know, come across after that, are related to things being seized or dirty uh, and just not lubricated. So uh, I think this was probably in working condition um, at one point, and it just wasn't used for so many years, and things have gummed up a little bit. But uh, that's nothing that I can't fix with some WD-40 and some lubricant um, and just, you know, some good old cleaning. So uh, I've managed to get a decent number of the functions to work, and I know what's wrong with some of them, and uh, I want to go over that. Uh, but I'm going to take the covers off um, to actually show you around inside. Uh, I know I'm going to have to buy a new ribbon for this thing, of course. Um, it did come with one, um, but it is so dry, uh, I think the best word to describe this is crispy. Um, but I have the geared, um, the geared uh, spools, which is really what's important. You can still buy fabric ribbons brand new these days, and I can easily uh, put them on these spools because, uh, it's, of course, it's got the auto advancing stuff. So that's easy, um, no problem there. But I'm not going to buy those until I have the unit functioning, um, you know, to the point where if I put a ribbon in it, it would actually start working. And it's not quite there yet. So there are two covers on this typewriter. There's a rear cover, which I've already removed, uh, which is just this metal piece here. And then there's this front cover, which has this top cover. Now the top cover, um, it's just got two spring-loaded tabs, which you can pull on. And this folds out, and this provides access uh, in here where you can change the... Uh, the ribbon, and uh, of course you got all the hammers here. Um, I'm not sure if there's a better name for these. Um, it's been a while. Uh, but anyway, you can access all the stuff in here. There are a few levers and things um, that uh, you know the user's able to access from this panel. Um, it does have some lettering on here. doesn't mean much to me. You can see the paint is starting to crack in here. Uh, it does have a service, um, some sort of service tag. Uh, it looks like they've written over um, over stuff, so it's a little difficult to make out. I can see some dates here, 59, 60, so on. Um, there was actually a label, like a, someone like made a label maker label and put on the bottom of this unit, um, which says 1965. So given this is a 63 and it was, or, or a 53 and it was, uh, you know, tagged with 65, it was probably in service until 65 or, you know, at least 65. But anyway, um, to get this cover off and get all the cover, covers off, there's this black metal frame um, which has some rubber bushings into the rest of the frame and there's just simple, everything's flathead screws on the bottom. Two, two screws remove this back cover and uh, four screws remove this cover and uh, pretty much all you have to do is pull the color control lever up. Uh, this changes the position of the ribbon and then um, you should be able to lift this panel up. I don't know if I can do this. No, I can do this one-handed and this comes off to reveal uh, slightly more of the unit. Then there's another four screws into these rubber bushings which, uh, take, which allow you to take this keyboard guard off. And uh, this is about as naked as I've had the unit at this point. And uh, really the only uh, damage that I've found on this thing so far um, is uh, this control over here. Unfortunately, there's a lever that actually is supposed to stick on here and uh, be available underneath the unit for adjusting whatever this is. I, I actually don't really know what this control does. Um, that's, that's another thing I'll mention. I haven't been able to find any manuals for this. So I'm pretty much um, learning how this thing works uh, as I diagnose it. Uh, it's actually, from what I've understood so far, it's actually quite fascinating how this works, and um, you really need to be able to see the underside to understand how this works. But this control is so far pretty much the only thing that completely baffles me. I know what pretty much everything does except for this, um, and maybe once I get it working, I can play with that, uh, or maybe someone will tell me what this does. Um, the power switch is on this side, and uh, you can see the the little tab that there's supposed to be. Um, sticking down on this side, which is broken. Now you can still move this, so it still functions. Um, even with the cover on, you can still move it from the bottom, so it's not a big deal, and it doesn't look like it's something that you probably do all too often, so I'm not too worried about that. Uh, the only other problem is there is a, a rope on this side, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you better later, which is quite frayed. It's not broken, and it, so it should work fine, but as far as longevity goes, I'm not quite sure how long that will last. So anyway, uh, so once I had uh, found that the power switch 
um, was open circuit. And I'll get back to the power switch shortly. Um, I basically just took it out of circuit and hot wired the thing. So I basically just got just a little jumper um, with the two wires from the ends of the power switch. And uh, I ohmed it out. There was 45 ohms between the two, which was obviously the stator winding. And I, I brought it up on a Variac. You know, I, I do have a Variac. And anyway, uh, it came up just fine, and the motor starts spinning. So the motor is located back here. Uh, I'll give you a better view from the underside. And uh, these belts actually are in pretty decent condition, actually. Uh, I'm sure I could get you know, more if I, if I had to, but uh, everything does work uh, quite well um, as far as the, uh, the electrics go. So once I had the motor spinning, I uh, wanted to see if pressing any of the keys would cause a hammer to uh, fire up towards the page. And uh, that was when I realized that, that the keys didn't move. The spacebar would go down, but that didn't cause the carriage to uh, move over. So that was one problem. But the, uh, the letters would not go down more than like half a millimeter and then they would reach uh, like an end stop. And they all moved in exactly the same pattern, which made me think that there was something else going on. It wasn't just a key being jammed. It actually physically wouldn't go down. And the other thing I noticed was that the shift keys um, would, were actually, basically they were stuck down. Um, they, weren't, uh, they, they weren't moving really at all. So uh, this is when I went to the underside of the unit and uh, I'll flip this thing over so I can explain better as to uh, what I found. So this is the underside of the unit. I've just tipped it over here. And uh, you can see the electric motor here. Um, this is either a start or a run capacitor for the motor, I'm not entirely sure. This actually does appear to be functional. Um, I'm still a little scared having this plugged in because it's directly across, it uh, looks like it's directly across the motor, so um, that's going to have, you know, mains across it. So I don't know, maybe I'll replace that, I'm not quite sure. Uh, it doesn't get hot, hot in operation, so it seems to be okay. Uh, but anyway, back to the keys. So you can see that each key here has its own uh, metal rod. And I'm, I'm sure that there are proper names for all of the things I'm going to be pointing out, but I'm going to be using layman's terms because I don't know what the proper mechanical word for all of these linkages are. Um, each key has its own rod, and you can see that there's a spring here which allows each, uh, which forces each to return to its sort of normal position. And uh, ultimately, I discovered that the reason they weren't going down was because of this uh, this rod right here, and you'll notice it's not actually a just a rod. It's actually got this metal uh, sort of flange on it, and this is basically a key lockout feature, and it actually is tied in with the uh, the power switch. So this is the power switch here. This is the the off position. This is the on position, and it's got a little uh, nice little graphic which shows through the window in the top case. And it has a little metal linkage which goes all the way back here uh, to where the actual power switch was mounted. Uh, I'll, I will come back to that, uh, but you can see I've removed it. And that would actually, that would actually turn the motor on and off. And uh, I thought that was simply all this piece of plastic was for, but as it turns out, this is tied into this key lockout mechanism. And there are actually a few functions that you can perform. For example, the, uh, the margin set, uh, when you press that, it will actually push this bar over in such a way that when you press a key down, it doesn't actually travel all the way down. And I believe, of course, this is done so that when certain functions are activated, you can't jam up the mechanism by pressing a key at the same time. And when you turn the unit off by moving this to the off position, this piece of plastic actually presses these two levers, or this lever which pushes this lever, which moves this key lock over and basically engages the key lock. So you can't press any keys of the keyboard while the unit is off. But when you turn it on, um, of course this is supposed to release and the this spring is supposed to pull this back over to allow the keys to go down. But as you can see, that's not happening. And I believe that this is because the this, this rod has corroded inside and it's not pivoting very easily. Now I can manually assist if I press this over, I can help it move. And that's really all you have to do. You can maybe see here if I get the camera angle right, you can actually see it moving over. 
And now I can press a key all the way down and now it bottoms out as it's supposed to. And so that's that was the first thing and uh, once I had figured that out um, I could press a key and a hammer would move. Um, and some of the keys uh, work better than others in the sense that some of them will go up and they'll strike you know the ribbon and the page um, and some of them will get close but they will stop a few millimeters short and uh, my suspicion is that it's a again it's a lubrication issue some of them um, have you know just need a little bit more uh, have they have a little bit more resistance than they should um, some of them when I started they only moved halfway up and then after actuating more and more times they're getting closer and closer to the page so I think it's a situation of hosing things down with lubrication um, to get them working again and so of course I want to figure out how this is actually working how this this mechanism works and uh, it's pretty much imperative to understanding how the the whole typewriter works so I might as well go over it now the motor uh, as you saw before the motor has a, uh, a gear drive on it which uh, there's like a, a, a toothed belt which drives an intermediary pulley which then drives this pulley right here you can see the bottom of it and then there's this rubber roller which runs the full length of the machine which is directly connected to this roller and so you can see I can I can turn this and this turns the, uh, the roller now you'll notice that there are these little plastic uh, sort of toothed I'm not really sure what you would what you would exactly call these paddles or something and there's one of these for each key on the keyboard and there's a couple uh, metal ones uh, not plastic on the sides focusing just on the keys what basically happens is when you press uh, a key down all you're doing is basically fighting this spring which is very light to move this arm down and all this arm does is it kicks these little dogs basically into the roller so if I press a key let's see if I can get this on camera if I press a key you can see how when I press the key it sort of wedges the tip of this against the roller it's disengaged there if I press another key it wedges the key against the roller and of course when the unit's powered up this roller is always spinning and so as soon as you press this wedge against the roller because it's rubber and this is toothed, it's grippy, the, at that point you don't have to exert any more energy and the motor will now impart the energy through this roller and it will pull this, this paddle up and that is what actually uh, transfers the energy from the motor into the hammer and then of course this resets. And this appears to be the way that it transfers all of the energy um, to all of the components. So everything from backspace, space, um, advancement of the ribbon is all performed by, if I can get this uh, to be a little bit uh, less bright here, there's uh, metal dogs here, there's three of them on this side, and there's two of them on this side, which do the same thing. So it appears that really all of the, uh, the energy gets transferred through this roller at some point. And uh, so this was uh, one of the things I, I cleaned first. Uh, I can, I'll probably do a better job but as you can see, this is quite, quite uh, well corroded under here. There's not too much rust. It's just uh, not sure if, what what this was, if it was aluminum or something. But it is quite crusty, and uh, that's probably why quite a few components are seized. And uh, you'll also notice one thing that I I noticed pretty pretty immediately, just because of how irregular it was, is all these little tiny flathead screws of different heights along here, and my suspicion is that this is effectively the calibration for the position of these uh, of these dogs so they catch correctly and uh, through testing I've discovered that the R key is the only key that's actually not functioning correctly um, and when you hit the R key basically it catches it, ha it hammers the page and then it catches again hammers the page and it enters this self oscillating loop it doesn't actually disengage so I'm assuming I can just find that s adjustment screw and I should be able to adjust that so that it doesn't catch uh, repeatedly and I should be able to fix that and uh, similarly these these screws here and these uh, metal um, pins uh, you can see the three on this side and the two down here these correspond to the adjustment for the actual metal dogs for the uh, other features and uh, that is uh, one of the other issues that I have 
have noticed, but I'll get there uh, once I uh, go through things sort of in chronological order of uh, how I figured things out. So, you know, I found out what was going on with the key lock, and that sort of got me to how does this thing transfer power, how do the keys actually work, and uh, so on and so forth. This is just a, a learning exercise. Um, I'm just sort of replaying what I did in what order. So with the unit on the bottom again, you can see the gear train here. The motor spins here, that's the intermediate gear, and then that's the pulley we were just looking at for the uh, rubber roller. And uh, you can see the, uh, the dogs kind of from down here. There's two on this side, um, and then the other ones are buried quite deep down in there. Uh, I'm avoiding trying to take the whole thing apart. I'm going to try and do as much as I can um, with it kind of in this state. I really don't want to spend uh, too much uh, effort in getting this apart because, uh, you know, remembering how it goes together is uh, going to be a challenge. So as for th the state of things, as I sort of played with things, um, as far as the keyboard goes and features goes, um, the, all of the keys, like I said, all the keys work. Some of them don't make it to the page, but I think with lubrication I can fix that. The R key has the repetitive triggering problem, which I believe I can uh, fix with uh, adjusting that adjustment. The, uh, the shift. So the, the reason why the shift keys were stuck down is because the shift lock was stuck. And so if you look down here, the shift lock at the bottom, right down there, the shift lock has a little... Uh, catch, which when you press the shift lock, it sticks underneath this bar. And then what you're supposed to be able to do is press the shift key, and a spring is supposed to move that out from under the bar, so you can then bring the whole carriage up again. Uh, but unfortunately that doesn't work, so you kind of have to jiggle it to get it free, or, like what I've had to do here, is actually reach underneath it and unhook it. So again, I think with some lubrication, or maybe a, a better spring, uh, I suspect lubrication, though. Um, I can get uh, this to disengage automatically. And so this actually does have a power, uh, a power uh, shift. So when you press shift, you're not actually pressing the, uh, the escarpment? Is that what this is called? I don't remember. Um, you aren't actually moving it down. There is actually a, a mechanical linkage here, um, and uh, I have no idea really how it works, but it actually does, under the power of the motor, move the whole unit down and up again. The whole machine kind of shakes when it does this. It's a huge amount of metal that has to move very quickly when you press a shift. Um, so the shift works, the shift lock I can fix. Uh, the tab does work, so the carriage moves over um, with tabs, as well as the tab clear and set also works. And the way the tab setting works is pretty awesome. So, of course, this thing not having any memory, how does it remember where the tabs are? Um, because, of course, a tab is not a fixed width in this. It's not like, you know, a tab moves you over eight spaces or whatever. A tab is wherever you set it to be. You can have no tabs, you can have one tab, you can have, you know, 80 tabs. And the way it, it works is it uses little metal, um, little metal uh, pins, basically, as memory. So on the back of the carriage here, and I hope that, uh, maybe if I... Maybe if I take this out, we can see it a little bit better. On the back of the carriage here, you'll see all these little metal um, tabs. And these are actually, effectively, the memory for the, uh, for the tab feature. So if I move the carriage somewhere, you'll notice this piece right here in the middle, this is actually used for setting and clearing the tabs. So in sort of this sort of normal state here, uh, there is, uh, the, the tab is not set, and when this uh, is kicked over, it is set. And so if I use the button here, uh, if I press this, you'll notice how it kicks over or pops back the, uh, that metal pin tab thing. Uh, my vocabulary is not great with this video, is it? Uh, it basically sets or clears the tab and you can do this in any position along the entire width of the carriage. So you'll see I've set a couple, um, a couple tabs. Um, you know, there's four or five of them on there uh, just to see it work. But it will tab over to those in a stop um, when you press the tab key. So the uh, the tab feature works properly, which is uh, pretty great. Uh, the color control, really, as far as I know, all this does is it adjusts the height of the ribbon um, when it comes up. Um, when a character is um, 
striked against it. Um, I don't believe that this works because I don't see um, the ribbon uh, pieces coming up, ribbon guides coming up. Um, so I suspect that something is seized in this, uh, in this, uh, I want to say circuit, but uh, it's, it's, it's not a circuit. Um, so something in that mechanism is definitely uh, seized up. The, uh, uh, the space bar does not work, and single character advancement of the carriage doesn't work. So when you press a key and the hammer goes up and strikes the, the page, uh, the carriage, of course, is supposed to move one space to the left. That doesn't happen. Similarly, when you press a space bar, nothing happens. Um, and so uh, I know that the carriage can move left because when I press tab, the carriage moves, um, and it does that under power, but it doesn't do the single uh, character advancement. And uh, only last night, um, literally the last thing I was working on before I went to sleep, uh, I did discover what, what is going on with that. And the space bar, it actually activates one of the metal dogs down here that attaches to that rubber roller. And uh, that is what imparts some energy on it. And then there's a, a lever, which I'll, I'll show you in just a bit, um, that it, uh, it moves and that's what causes the carriage to advance. And I suspect um, that that's also what happens when you press a key. And anyway, the pivot that that lever is on is uh, very hard to move and I can put a screwdriver and I can move it manually and the carriage advances, but it can't, this little spring on it is not strong enough to move it. So uh, I think there's some, some lubrication, maybe I'll put some WD-40 to see if I can try and free that up. Um, so it clearly works, it's just, uh, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not freely moving enough to do it under its own power. So um, that's a problem that I can solve. Um, the backspace key has sort of a similar problem. You press a backspace key, it sometimes will try to move the carriage back. It'll move maybe half a character back, and then of course it doesn't catch, so it just moves right back to where it was. Um, or other, sometimes it'll actually just uh, freeze the carriage completely. Looking at the back of the machine, if you look down here under the, uh, under the carriage, this metal piece right here uh, that is actually, uh, in my machine, what's getting stuck um, when the backspace uh, basically it causes the carriage to completely freeze. You actually can't even manually move the carriage at all, uh, left or right. And uh, anyway, this, this metal ring here, um, there's this little sort of folded L-shaped metal uh, arm that's supposed to press this, this ring, uh, you know, to the left of the machine looking, uh, looking from the front. And anyway, it, it gets stuck and it's not able to do that, and so I have to manually put a screwdriver in to move it. So it's another lubrication point, but I suspect that if I fix that, the backspace will probably start working again. Um, and then that really leaves me with the carriage return, which is the, uh, the last thing that I haven't really totally figured out yet. So the carriage return does cause the carriage to move under power all the way back, um, all the way to the right, uh, and then of course it's supposed to uh, move the paper one, two, or three um, spaces, or uh, lines, should I say. Ugh. I'm doing this on the floor because this thing is so heavy. I don't even know if my Ikea desk would uh, collapse under the weight of this thing. Um, so yeah, this is the line, of course this is, this is the uh, line spacing, one, two, or three lines. And it does do that, it does advance, uh, and sometimes it works fine. And sometimes it actually stalls the motor. Um, it actually, something gets stuck. Something, I believe something's not disengaging properly. And um, I actually end up having to sort of move the motor forward and back and kind of play around with stuff. And then eventually there's some click and then it all frees up again. So I, I'm sure there's something that has to be lubricated. I just haven't found it yet. Um, that, but the carriage return, it's all functionally working. It just doesn't, uh, doesn't work reliably. Uh, as for the rest of the uh, the carriage here, um, of course we've got the uh, the paper feed lever. This just loosens up the uh, spacing in here, so you can feed paper in the center and get it all aligned and everything. Of course, we have the button, which allows you to um, disengage the uh, the gear, so that way you can uh, align uh, some text with the uh, the uh, lines of the machine. We've got. Uh, Two buttons here, which of course are for manual movement of the carriage. 
Uh, this one, as you can see, gets stuck a little bit. Uh, this one's perfect, so I think it's actually just catching on the uh, on this casing here, which pops up, so I may have to maybe bend that a little bit, I'm not quite sure. Uh, this, of course, this is the, um, what does this do again? I have now forgotten what this does. Oh no, this is the, uh, this is the uh, gear release. That's what that is. Um, we've got the, uh, of course, the paper guide, which flips up. Um, again, another paper guide. This also flips up as well, um, but uh, it's a little difficult with uh, this. I'm not quite sure what order you're supposed to bring these up on, because uh, last time I opened this, it didn't look like I was doing it right, and so I'm going to avoid opening that again. Uh, just because I don't want to break anything. And uh, this, what I believe this is, is ha has something to do with the... Um, it's, I think this is a copy count, is what I think this is. Because you'll notice when, when I move this, it very, very slowly, very gradually, moves the roller in and out um, closer to here. So I believe um, this may have something to do with... Uh, making additional copies of a document because I know that was a big feature of these was you could put multiple sheets of paper in here like and 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 you could have this thing um, strike with such force that it would create you know multiple carbon copies that was a big feature of this thing so I believe that's the copy count it may also be that this has something to do with the copy count uh, as well I don't really know uh, but this is very clearly decisive you know one two three so 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 on and so forth it also has a zero position which is a bit odd. This goes zero to ten, but it's it's linear. Um, it's just a uh, it's just a a linear movement, and uh, it actually adjusts um, something to do with those plastic uh, teeth rollers uh, or to teeth uh, dogs. It actually moves them, uh, or it moves it moves the preload or something on them. Um, I haven't quite traced how where that goes yet, um, but I will update you once I figure that out. And uh, I think the last thing that I haven't talked about is the margins. So the margin set and margin release. The margin release appears to work. Um, the margin set I haven't really used because when you press margin set, it, invo it, in it engages that key lock bar, which of course um, you have to manually disengage. So I haven't really been playing too much with this because it's a pain in the ass to disengage that. So I'm going to try and get those uh, fixed up. And... Uh, uh, once I have that working, then I'll, I'll play around with that. But I suspect that that will probably work uh, fine with, you know, the necessary lubrication. So, yeah, so really, at this point, i got to fix the single character advancement with the space, the R key, the return, and um, the, the color control. I'd like to get this working. It's not necessary because I'm probably just going to have an all-black ribbon, but, you know, who knows. And then there's the power switch. So let me come back to that. So after I realized that the power switch was, of course, integrated with this key lock, I wanted to see if there was a way I could get the power switch to work again. Uh, because, of course, the power switch, um, it has this sort of this, um, if I can get this to focus, it has this nice little pinhole here. And, of course, this is specifically designed to work with that linkage. And, uh, of course, you know, it's going to probably be hard for me to find a switch that would work in the same way. So anyway, it was just riveted together, so I took it apart. And uh, this is what was in the switch. You can see, unfortunately, these, these sort of uh, rivet pins are, are, are no longer usable, but I can always get a, uh, just a little, like a very small nut and bolt to hold the switch back together, and I probably will be because the switch actually looks okay inside. Um, it's basically just a little uh, barbell-shaped piece of brass um, and this very strange, it's almost like laminated... I don't even know what material it looks like. Uh, what's it called? Uh, my mind is blanking. I know what this is called. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, they've just sort of laminated this, uh, this phenolic board together. Uh, and they've got two little grooves where the, the sort of the barbell uh, sits and it bridges the gap between these two brass contacts. And other than the fact that the contacts look black... Um, there's nothing mechanically wrong here. Uh, the switch looks fine, the, uh, the roller looks fine, uh, and so I think this is just a case of, you know, uh, contact wear and, oxidiza and oxidation. So, uh, I'm actually going to try and clean this. This is actually going to be the first thing I want to do, because I want to get rid of that, that sort of hot wiring I did. 
and get those wires tucked back up inside so they stop moving around every time I tip the thing on its side because I don't, I don't want to break those wires off. Um, so I'm going to try and clean this and uh, put this back together again, see if I can find something to hold the uh, switch casing back together again with. And uh, yeah, if I can get the switch working again, that would be pretty awesome. Uh, and then I'm going to try and lubricate that bar um, because if I can get the thing to turn on and off, that's a huge help. Um, that fixes so many problems and makes diagnosing everything from now on a lot easier. After a few minutes with my uh, file set and uh, just an old toothbrush, you can see I've cleaned up the contacts. They look much better. They're actually shiny now. I did the same thing with the barbell and all the other stuff. It's all, uh, it's all clean now. And uh, so now I'm just going to put this thing back together. And I can't find my really small screws, so I'm going to try reinserting these bent pins and see how well they stick in if at least just for a temporary uh, way to hold this thing together. Um, I was thinking maybe even using uh, zip ties if I could uh, somehow file them down to fit through that hole. It's a lot smaller in person than it looks on camera. Um, so I'm not even sure now if the, the screws that I'm thinking of that I can't find would even, would even fit. But uh, I'll keep looking for them uh, in the meantime. But I just want to get this back together so I can test it to see if it, it uh, indeed does work properly. I gave up trying to find any more fasteners and, and I ended up just using a big wrench to force the, uh, the old pins back through the switch. And they actually ended up protruding enough that I was able to flatten them down again with the same wrench. So I've effectively recreated the, uh, the rivets and uh, the switch is being held together and it actuates. And so now uh, it's time to test whether the switch works. So we're on uh, continuity mode here. So let's, uh, let's try it out and uh, try and do this one-handed, which is yay. And then we flip the switch. Nothing. Flip it back. Continuity. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. You get the idea. The switch works. Yeah, switch works. So that's it. We have a working, working switch. So uh, I'm really happy that I was able to fix this. So uh, I'll put this back in after I lubricate the uh, that bar, and uh, we should have a working, uh, working power on/off system. So I got out probably the oldest can of WD-40 I've ever seen and some silicone lubricant. And I've worked it into all of the points along the, uh, the key lock mechanism. And I can safely say that after probably a hundred or so actuations, it now operates under its own power. Uh, it works perfectly now. So I'll just have to reinstall the switch uh, and I should be able to get a fully working, you know, on off um, mechanism as it was intended. Now, one thing that I uh, remember I forgot to mention was I was talking about the backspace, or uh, not the backspace, sorry, the, uh, the single character carriage advancement wasn't working. And uh, I told you that there was something that was seized and I didn't actually point out what it was. So I've got the unit on its other side now, so the motor's on the top. And uh, the only way to see it is in through this hole right in here. Um, I'm not sure how well the uh, camera is going to see it. But up in there, you can see a spring on the left and uh, there's a little, uh, a little tab with a screw going through it. And that tab uh, is what actually uh, performs the single character advance when it goes back and forth. And you'll notice that there's a linkage that's sitting, it's not connected to anything. That linkage um, is supposed to connect to that tab. I've, I've already disconnected that, I did that yesterday. And that linkage goes all the way through to the, uh, the second, um, or in this case, the topmost metal dog there. And that is uh, what's supposed to contact the roller and start the uh, character advancement. And uh, what was happening was that that uh, sort of um, tab had gotten seized um, so far over that this roller um, would actually this this dog would actually not get it wasn't it wasn't even close enough to contact this roller. And the reason I, I sort of realized this was, of course, these. Uh, these adjustment points, which I talked about earlier, uh, the point is that you know this this metal tab rests on the screw, and then you adjust the screw, which pushes the tab out. And there's a spring that's supposed to return it 
uh, to pressing onto this screw. Well, it was actually off of the screw by a good, you know, three or four millimeters, and I couldn't move it either way. And it was because it was actually that 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 tie rod was actually stuck to that uh, that seized uh, uh, tab, and that was uh, the whole the whole mechanism was basically stuck on. Uh, and I wonder if that has something to do with why backspace wasn't working and also maybe why the carriage return had problems. So I'm going to try and break that free with some WD-40 and lubricate that. And uh, I think I'm going to call it uh, call it a day uh, if I can get that stuff all working. I'll, I'll install the power switch and I'll show you that working. And then, of course, I'll fire this thing up because I know you're probably thinking, oh, God, I've gone so long and he's never going to turn the damn thing on. So I will turn it on after I, I get that done. Okay, so it's been about 45 minutes. Uh, this took me quite a lot longer than I thought. This was substantially more difficult to free up than the, uh, the locking bar. And uh, so basically this rod here, um, I, had to w I had to put a lot of WD-40 into this to get it unstuck. Um, and uh, one thing that really made this possible, of course, of course first of all, unhooking that, uh, that linkage was pretty much necessary. But what I did was I took some coat hanger and I actually bent it and made a little hook uh, in this side, a little eyelet. And uh, basically what this does is this, this rod, it's a, it's a transfer rod, it transfers power from up here down this rod to uh, this end and there's a little hook on the end of this. And so what I did was I f spun this thing with that rod disconnected, I can spin this thing out of basically almost like a 180 degrees uh, backwards. And uh, that way the rod appears down in this area here where I could then hook this onto it and then move it back and forth. It's not in its normal range of travel, but it allowed me to get lots and lots, like hundreds and hundreds of cycles uh, on that uh, to free it up over time. So actually, if I, uh, if I get the uh, screwdriver out, I might be able to show that to you so you can see what I did. What I did. So if I press on... Sorry, I can't really look at the camera and do this at the same time. So if I press on that, uh, that ring um, and push it back into towards the spring, you can now see on the bottom of this rod, there's this uh, L-shaped piece of metal here. That's, uh, that's, this, that's this piece right here. And so what I did was I hooked the... Um, hooked the, uh, the coat hanger on the end of that and I can now pull and move that rod back and forth very rapidly and uh, that's what allowed me to get the, uh, the cycles I needed on this thing and then of course I can just use a screwdriver to put the rod back into place and uh, now it returns to its zero position automatically. So I'm going to try and hook the linkage back up and uh, then I should have carriage advance. So before I go messing with the power switch, I've just got it uh, upright again. I've got it on a pizza box here just so that uh, the WD-40 doesn't drip onto my carpet and this seems to fit pretty well. So I am going to plug it in and now that I think I've got that linkage installed again back to that uh, dog on the roller. So now hopefully the space bar should work. So, um, of course, I just got this on a power bar, so I have to use that as a power switch in the time being. So, let's turn it on. Okay, so it's on. You can see the motor spinning and the belt is running. So, the moment of truth, does the space bar work? Yes, it does. And that should also mean that I have single character advancement. And I do. Sometimes. It might just, it appears to depend on the character. See, this is one of the characters that doesn't make it all the way. So you can see the F key here makes it all the way, but the G key doesn't make it all the way to the paper. And so it's not triggering the uh, carriage advancement. But if I use the space, it does work. So it's just so nice to see that working. Let's see if the return works or if it stalls out the motor. Okay, so the return worked there. Um, ah, okay, so we got a problem here. So you'll notice that it doesn't advance the carriage 
at the beginning. Um, this is a common problem. Uh, I've had this happen on regular typewriters. So if I help this along by pulling on it, I'll use my foot here to press the space bar. Yeah, so the mechanism's working, but there's not enough tension pulling the carriage. So I think this is, uh, and then yeah, at some point it, it works from then on. So yeah, um, I'm not sure if there's something, uh, it needs to be lubricated or if there's a, a tensioning problem, but uh, I, I've seen this before. So, uh, so it's not perfect, but it seems to work from at least, you know, maybe a quarter or a third of the way onwards, which is okay. So, okay, I mean, that's a major step forward uh, for me. Uh, I am probably going to uh, lubricate the backspace and lubricate the, uh, uh, the hammers and stuff, see if I can get, like, the G key. Um, I'd really like to see if I can get a method that will make this key start to work again, and then I can apply that to all of the keys. I wonder what, what, what backspace will do now. Ah, backspace is working now. Yeah, so backspace is working properly now. I haven't done anything to it. See, it's now going back one space. So clearly, I think the space uh, being all stuck probably prevented the backspace from working. In fact, what may have happened is the space was stuck on, the backspace would then effectively try to backspace and space at the same time, and that's why the carriage would jam. So um, that actually, that, that, fixed, that fixed two problems at once, which is uh, quite nice. So uh, yeah, and so just to show you, when you press a shift, it mechanically brings all of the hammers up and down. And you'll notice there's actually a lag from the time that I press it to the time it happens. And that's probably the amount of time it takes for a certain, like, uh, the, the roller to get into a specific position, um, which is quite, quite cool. And so if we, if we look at the, uh, the tab key, yeah, so you know, at, the, at the beginning it doesn't work properly, but if I, if I tab over, you can see the tab works, and let's try the return again. It worked again. I wonder, I wonder if this space thing getting stuck was actually uh, behind a couple of the problems. But anyway, so let me install the power switch and I'm going to wrap up this video. Here's the power switch, reinstalled, so it's got this little cardboard condom on it to prevent anything from touching it. The linkage is reinstalled, and I've just got the two, uh, two cloth coated wires screwed in. They've got nice little eyelets on them, so they're just screwed in. I'll tuck these in here. They seem to be well away from harm, and uh, now when I flip the front, you can hear the switch is making contact, and of course our key protect is moving in and out on its own. So I think the uh, power is perfectly done on this thing. And uh, one thing that's kind of interesting to note, which I didn't realize until after I installed the switch, is the switch actually doesn't go in square. This linkage is actually on an angle, and so the switch actually has to go on an angle to avoid uh, fouling on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the bar there. So anyway, let's uh, plug it back in and uh, get it to power on with its own switch now. So here it is, all back, and it's off, and as you can see the uh, motors are not spinning, and let's uh, flip the switch and see what happens. There we go. So the power switch does actually work after all. It just needed a really good clean. And uh, the key lock works. I turn it off. I can't press any of the keys down. Turn it on, and I can press keys. So uh, yeah, it works. And the other thing that I want to point out uh, is the uh, the color control actually does work. So in its all the way down position, and I press a key, you can see that nothing happens to the guides. I move it up to the first position, you can see it moves slightly. Second position moves more, and third position moves the most. So. Now the color control actually does work. I don't know why I'd never noticed that before. Maybe it was just in the always off position. So yeah, um, so that is one thing I don't have to fix. Um, so uh, yeah, really I think the big, the big challenge with me is going to be figuring out how to get some of these keys to go all the way up and of course uh, to get the carriage moving because um, of course the carriage is not, not moving under its own power um, at the beginning. Similarly, the F key now 
actually doesn't go all the way. Uh, it used to go all the way, but now it doesn't. And that was literally just from me turning it over and bringing it back. So um, more investigation is needed around that. But I am happy to leave it in this state for now because uh, it is uh, far better than it was yesterday. So anyway, uh, hopefully you uh, found this interesting or uh, useful in the event you have one of these. If you've got any information for me, if you have one of these and you've done work on it before, of course uh, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, I'll be making another video probably uh, next weekend or something when I get more time to uh, uh, work on uh, addressing some of the remaining issues. At this point I think it's I'm confident enough that this thing will work so I'll probably place an order for a ribbon so that hopefully I, I don't have to sit around waiting weeks to get one once the thing works. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll order that soon and hopefully it'll arrive by the time this thing is fully working. But anyway, um, I think that's it for today and uh, that's it for part one. So uh, as always, thanks for watching.